Today I'm going to walk through the middle school version of the Corn Mash and Distillation Lab by Kansas Corn. My name is Brian Nelson and I am one of the Kansas Corn STEM lead teachers and today we're going to walk through our middle school version of Corn Mash and Distillation. Um, this is a wonderful lab that I really enjoy teaching with my own students and one of the reasons why I really love this lab is because it's extremely highly engaging. Um, it, the students really feel like they're doing some really relevant science to their lives. It allows them to use some lab equipment they're not always used to and familiar with. But one of the main reasons I love it is because um, the environmental uh, topics are so relevant today and uh, they are so important to this generation of students. They're really engaged and very interested in what we're doing with this lab. And one of the things we're going to do today is we're going to start with our, our corn grind. And by the end of this video, we'll take this all the way to the end product. At the end, we'll have some ethanol, uh, which we can actually uh, burn and is a, uh, be used as a biofuel. All right. All right, the materials that uh, we have before you that you'll need for this lab are your corn mash. Uh, you'll need a hot plate for this. Uh, you'll also need some buffer solution, some enzymes, and some yeast. Okay, this is just the first day procedure. This is a lab that is usually done over two days. Uh, the first day consists of making your corn mash and then letting the yeast do their job and ferment overnight and produce the ethanol for you. And day two, which you'll see later, is where we actually uh, distill the corn mash and extract the ethanol uh, from our product. All right, let's jump right in. All right, the first thing you're gonna to wanna to do is use your digital scale to mass out uh, 100 grams of the ground corn. Fortunately, I've already done that for you. And then you're gonna to want to measure out 300 uh, milliliters of warm water. And we'll go ahead and we'll mix those. Now, after we get this mixed, we're going to want to heat our corn. Right now, the corn is not in a state where it's very easy for the yeast to uh, process and be, uh, ferment the uh, starches and the sugars there. So what we need to do is we need to break the corn down from its starch form into simpler sugars that the yeast can more easily metabolize. So the first thing we're gonna do is a mechanical breakdown. So we're gonna heat our corn mash uh, and that's going to uh, start breaking down the corn uh, to make it easier for uh, our next steps. So we'll put it in one of our nice tall beakers. Okay. And we're going to create what I like to refer to as a warm water bath. Uh, just put a little bit wa of water in a larger beaker. Set this inside. We'll go ahead and we'll get that uh, water boiling. And uh, we want to heat this from anywhere from 8 to 15 minutes. It just depends on uh, the hot plate you use and how hot it gets. Uh, you want to be stirring your corn mash periodically as uh, it is heating. And the way you're going to know when your corn mash is ready uh, is because you're going to get a change in the consistency. You might even get a small change in color. Uh, you want to, when you stir your uh, corn mash, uh, to have it have more of a thicker oatmeal consistency. And I've already prepared one here, and you can see that it is quite a bit thicker uh, than the corn mash that uh, we started with. 
Our next procedure, is, after we're done boiling, is that we need to add uh, some more water to kind of thin it down and add some buffer solution to this. So we're going to add an additional 100 milliliters of water. And we're going to add 35 milliliters of buffer solution. Now at this point in time, your corn mash is going to be very hot after it's come off of the hot plate. And one of the most important steps is to let this cool. Um, you want to get your corn mash down to less than 58 degrees uh, Celsius, somewhere between I think uh, 58 and 37 degrees uh, before you add any more of our other uh, products to the corn mash. One of the big reasons for this is if you add this too early, uh, add the enzymes too early, um, the enzymes are temperature sensitive and you can break down and destroy those enzymes and they won't be able to do uh, what they need to do. Fortunately, this mash is already cooled down so we can go ahead and we can add our next ing um, ingredients. First thing I want to do is use 10 milliliters of the glucoamylase solution. So I'll go ahead and extract that. The amylase is an enzyme that's really going to help uh, by breaking down uh, the cornstarch even further into smaller, simpler sugars. Okay, after you've added your um, first enzyme, you're going to want to mass out and put in five grams of yeast. After we've stirred this nice and well, I like to give this a few minutes uh, for the yeast to kind of wake up and get activated before I add the next enzyme. And the next enzyme, though, that we are going to add is the glucoamylase. And the glucoamylase further breaks down even those uh, um, st uh, simple sugars even further and can break off a glucose molecule off the end. And that glucose is one of the things that the yeast really love and use when they metabolize. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to put in our 10 more milliliters of the glucoamylase. And this is going to conclude day one. At this point in time, the yeast have everything that they need. They have uh, their food source, which is going to be our corn. Uh, the enzymes in here are helping to break down that corn starch into simple sugars and glucose. And the yeast are actually going to start metabolizing and creating two products, uh, carbon dioxide and um, ethanol. Now you are going to want to take a piece of saran wrap and cover the top. You don't want to put a rubber band over it because this is going to produce carbon dioxide and we don't want to trap it in here. We want to go ahead and let the carbon dioxide um, escape as needed. And, we, and um, you'll start seeing uh, some bubbles form in your... Um, and that lets you know that the yeast are producing the carbon dioxide and they're producing ethanol. The next day, you should see something that looks like this. When you take off your uh, saran wrap, you should smell a 
yeast, bread, alcohol smell. Uh, that's a that's a good sign that your yeast have been doing what they're doing. You can see if they switch to the top down view, you can see that this particular uh, mash that I put together yesterday is still bubbling. The yeast are still doing what they need to do. I can't tell you it has a nice smell to it. If it smells rotten or disgusting, it's not that good bread yeast smell, then you've uh, your uh, sample's been contaminated by with bacteria. At that point in time, you just need to throw it out start again there's really nothing you're you'll be able to do to salvage it but this right here is ready for day two i'm brian nelson and i teach the middle school version of the corn mass and distillation lab and i'm james burke and i teach the high school version uh, today james and i are going to team up for this particular part of the uh, day two corn mash and distillation because the procedure for distilling the ethanol out of our corn mash is the same for high school and middle school. And one of the reasons we need to uh, strain um, and get the solids out of our corn mash is because when we're using our um, um, distillation mantle, um, it can really Sometimes it can burn and, uh, and get a lot of uh, material in there that's really hard to clean out. In an actual ethanol plant, they would never go through this step. They, they distill um, the corn mash and all of the solids because there is still quite a bit of ethanol in the solids. We just do this to better preserve our lab equipment. And yeah. Okay, so we're going to pour the solids through some cheesecloth and a uh, strainer here to catch as much of the solid. Um, we're after the liquid for the distillation part. So um, like Brian mentioned, we will lose some of the ethanol, but it does make cleanup a lot better or a lot faster and easier. So yeah, let's go ahead and let me swirl that. this a little bit. Okay. Yeah, let's do a little bit of that. I like to do a little bit of a swirl technique. I think that helps it move through the cheesecloth and the strainer a little bit easier. And just, just, go ahead. I just grab it and squeeze it. So. Yeah. You, you want to? I'm, you I'm want impatient. Me to? You want, go ahead. Whatever. Go ahead and hold the side here. Right. Oh, you'll go ahead and squeeze uh, it. Sure. I guess, well, Try as we mentioned earlier, much. there's a lot of ethanol in the solids. So you just kind of got to reach in and squeeze and, out as much of our liquid as we can. And you'll get some solids through. It's not a big deal. It just, you don't want enough solids to be sitting on the bottom that it's going to scorch and make clean up a problem. It's, I've distilled with the solids in and it doesn't hurt anything, just makes clean up a mess. Definitely smell some ethanol in there. All right, well, open that up and add some more. Or do you want to put that in a can? Yeah, if you'll hold that, I'll go ahead and kind of get rid of some of the solids. Clean out our filter. Up. Yeah, speaking of, this is definitely uh, a messy part of the uh, lab. The kids do love this part, though. They do mention this is one of their favorite parts. If you're running the nutrient testing along with it, that's a good uh, saving. The corn sample there is really good as well. So now we've completed filtering our sample, we're going to use a funnel and pour it into our distillation flask. So we have our distillation apparatus set up here. Um, in the high school gas collection, we estimated we need to collect about 20 milliliters of of distillate, so we're going to turn it on. Is it warming up over there? We have water running through our condenser, and we want that coming in from the bottom and out through the top so it stays full. And when you're putting your apparatus together, all of your joints, you want to use a very small amount of this glass grease to keep your equipment from fusing together. 
Um, yep. One tip that we want you to use, Vaseline is not a good substitute, so you will want to use um, the high temperature. a high temperature grease uh, that we will send one of these uh, to each teacher so that you have the appropriate uh, high temperature grease to use. So now we're Heating the distillate, um, once it gets up to about 79, 80 degrees Celsius, um, you should start to see some conden condensation up in here. Um, that's going to have some water vapor in it still, but mostly ethanol because the boiling point is lower. Um, so that will eventually start co to condense in here and drip across. So we're trying to leave the water in this container and get all the ethanol into this container. James, would you like to talk to him about where you place the thermometer and why you place the thermometer where you um, put it? I this. This thermometer um, seals up here so you can adjust it, but you want it right where the junction is right here so you know what the, the vapor temperature is right here. It doesn't matter so much what it is down here or anywhere else. That tells us if it's 80 degrees Celsius here, that that's the boiling point for ethanol, so that's what's going to be condensing at that point. If you overshoot that, um, you'll be getting a lot more water driving across. In the other glassware, um, you had to heat it quite a bit higher, get into the 90 degree range to push it over. So we've let this run for a few minutes and you can start seeing some droplets condensing on the, the flask here. That will reflux or drip back down. Um, eventually these droplets will move up as the distillation progresses, it gets warmer. And you wanna keep an eye on your thermometer because it's gonna start going up relatively fast once it About 10 minutes in here and we're starting to see quite a bit of reflux up in this area. Our temperature has gone up to about 45 degrees Celsius. Once the temperature starts going up in the thermometer, um, it goes up relatively fast. That means you're getting some pretty good boiling going on down in the distillation flask and the vapor's condensing up in here. So you'll start to see some droplets form in here. Um, got a few droplets forming right here and we'll start seeing it dripping over relatively quickly. Okay, we're starting to get a lot, of, a lot of vapor condensing in the condenser, which is what we want. So we're going to turn the mantle down a little bit so we don't um, heat too much water. And we're starting to get some distillate dripping into our graduated cylinder. Again, based on our calculations, we don't want to go much over 20 milliliters. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to pour some of our distillate into a watch glass and if it if it will sustain a flame it's in the 35 to 40 percent ethanol range at least sometimes you have to heat it a little bit to get it to start evaporating and it's lit I believe. Okay. yeah it's it's burning in a good sustained flame probably about six five six inches tall if you attend a seed to stem workshop, um, the glassware, the mantle, and uh, ring stands are provided by Renew Kansas and Kansas Corn. And we'd love to see you guys uh, work with this equipment, making ethanol in your classroom with your uh, students. If you ever run into any issues with this, because as you can see, it's not a hard lab, but there is some uh, technical uh, aspects of it. So if you run into any issues whatsoever, you're welcome to contact myself or James. We, you can get a hold of this through uh, Kansas Corn uh, STEM. And we'll be available for any questions you might have.